Good morning. Welcome to Godot's Life Ministries. We appreciate you giving us the opportunity to join you in your homes today. We're not having any on-campus services today because of the weather, but we are broadcasting this service here live together so that we can come into your homes and you can enjoy us with a nice, warm, hot cup of coffee. God gave us a theme at the beginning of the year, and that theme is believe. And also with that theme, he gave us a theme scripture, and that theme scripture is? It's Acts uh, 16.31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. So every message that we're bringing to you this year is centered around our theme, Believe. We started a sermon series called Believe, and so far we've been trying to establish what it is that we believe in because we really truly want you to understand the gospel. We've been in the book of John, and we're going back to John today, but we're going to start off in 1 John, Mm -hmm. 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. We see right away that John gives us five things Mm -hmm. about the beginning. He says, he gives us five things about Christ who was in the beginning. He says, first thing he says, that which was from the beginning. So he immediately establishes Christ's history. He says that Christ was from the beginning. Then he goes a little step further. He says, which we have heard. So not only was he from the beginning, but some of us have actually heard his voice. He's talking about those disciples who walked with him. He talked about all of the crowds who heard his voice. And then he says also, he says, we have seen with our own eyes. So not only was he from the beginning, not only did we hear him, but some of us have seen him with our own eyes. And then the next part of the verse, he says, and we have looked upon him. Now, if you're if you thinking, well, if he say we have seen him with yeah. our eyes, then why would he turn around and say we have looked, we upon, have him. looked upon him? Mm-hmm. Well, that word is where we get our Greek word from. It means theater. I'm yeah. not going to pronounce the word. So when he says that we have looked upon him, he's saying that we have sat and watched him yeah. and studied yes. him as if we're watching a, a movie or a theater play in front of us. In other words, it means to give careful attention to. We have looked upon him. It's not just a passing glance. And have become acquainted with him mm-hmm. by experience, by personal experience. So John is writing a letter to, to these people. Mm-hmm. And he also says in a lot of parts of that verse, not only have we looked upon him, which means gave careful examination, it says our hands have held have been held, right, and uh, concerning the word of life. So then he moves into a more of a spiritual realm, right. Right? right? He talks about that we have beheld his glory. As I was studying this, um, I what stu- stood out to me was the beginning. So mm-hmm. last week we were in Genesis 1-1, and then we were also in John 1 and talking about In the the beginning, beginning, God created, and then in the beginning was the word. And then here he says, that which was from the beginning. So that word beginning stood out to me. So I looked it up, and it says, the beginning is the commencement of creation. Uh Humankind can look back to this beginning as an initial historical reckoning point. Mm -hmm. So this is the commencement of the earth, the commencement of life. And so he says, From the commencement of life, we have heard him, we have touched him, we have um, studied him, we have talked to him, we've experienced him, we've become acquainted with him. Mm -hmm. Now, also, now, you know, uh, in Genesis, it says uh, all things were created by him and through him, right? And there was nothing that was made, right? Now, I want to look at this verse again with that in mind. Let's read uh, 1 John. Matter of fact, let's go to Genesis real quick. Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In the beginning, God Uh created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of the Lord, mm -mm, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Next verse. 
And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now let's go back to John, 1 John 1. I want to uh, tie this together and show you something here. Because we're saying that that which was from the beginning, and we're speaking of Christ. Now let's read this verse. 1 John 1 and 1. That which was from the beginning, that's the commencement, which we have heard, mm -hmm. heard his teaching, which we have seen, we experienced him with our eyes, which we have looked upon or studied him, and our hands have handled or touched him, um, touched the word of God, the word of life, Jesus. Now you say, well, I haven't seen him, I haven't touched him, and I haven't heard him. But the scripture says that which was from the, the beginning. beginning, right? So he sums it up with that last part of verse 1. He says, concerning the word of life. Therefore, we are in existence today because of the word of life. Remember, he said, in the beginning, uh, God said, let there be light. And we know that Jesus is the light of the world. So he moves, John moves from a natural sense to a spiritual sense. Right. He's saying that even though you may not have been there to see him, to hear him, to study him, to look upon him, but because of the word of life yeah. that is in you, he has quickened you. He has made you aware of his presence. So God must reveal himself to you personally before you can have true fellowship with him. And that's where the belief takes place. Right. So if there hasn't been true fellowship, if you've not heard of him, if you've not seen him, if you've not experienced him, if you've not gotten divine illumination and revelation of his word, you can't believe. And so that means that there's no true relationship. Right. And, and it speaks to those who will tell you, well, how do you know the Bible's true? You weren't there. Well, I know the Bible is true because his word of life has quickened me. It has made me alive. Therefore, I can feel his presence. How do you know the wind is true? You don't know which direction it's coming from, right? Right. You, you, when you feel wind on your face, how, how do you know it's true? Well, you feel something on your face, right? Right. So we have God in our life, and therefore we know that it is true from the beginning. So he established his historical viewpoint, viewpoint <laughs> right? Look at number two. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness. And show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Again, he is trying to capture those in the audience to say, you didn't have to be there to know that God exists. Because his life has been manifest. Lord have mercy. He, it has been manifest. Look at that verse again. I want to read it um, on our slide. I'm using the easy English version. I don't use that version too often, but I like the way it read as I was studying it. Uh -huh. It says, the person who gives life came. Right. He showed this life to us. We saw it, and we are witnesses to it. We declare to you that this is eternal life. It was with the Father. It has now appeared to us. Amen. So Christ existed before he manifested himself to the people. Right. So when we look at the existence of God, it's not a debate of whether or not God exists. The debate should be whether or not we, God revealed himself to, to us. us. And he has revealed himself to us through the Son, Jesus Christ. And then and only then can we truly believe. Right. If we don't experience him for ourselves, then we are just being religious. Mm -hmm. And when you are religious, there, can no, there cannot be a relationship. Right. That's why there are so many uh, religions out there. In Christianity, the only person they're trying to kill off is Christ. Right. Because without Christ, there There's is no nothing. salvation. There is nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you can reduce Christ to being a prophet or a good man or just someone nice, then you can kill everything about him. And when you do that, you kill your way to the Father because no one gets to the Father but, but by Christ. Right. Which means that you cannot believe. Right. If you don't believe Christ came, then you, 
if, if, you, if he has not, if you have not looked upon him and if you have not touched his word through manifestation, right. through illumination, then we just continue to operate in religion, which means now the signs and the wonders and all of those things won't manifest. Right. So when you hear people say the lie, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Christ. No. You don't believe in God because the only way you can believe in God is through Christ. Christ. Christ is his manifestation of himself yeah. to the world. That's why it says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life for the life was manifested and we have seen it yes. and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. Mm -hmm. He was manifested to them. Right. And, and I like to look at it like this. Uh, Jesus is the road map. Yeah. He, he, he is the direction. Matter of fact, he says that himself. Let's go to John 14. John 14. And for those of you who've ever been uh, lost uh, traveling around, when you lose your way, the first thing you want to know is ask someone how to get to a certain spot. You know, you know, or show me the way. John 14, 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Mm -hmm. so, so he makes a declaration in this text. First of all, he says that you're lost. And in order to get back on the right track, you must understand that I am the way to that track. And, then, and, and once you understand that I am the way to that track... I'm going to lead you in the truth, which is going to lead you into life. And by the way, you cannot get to the Father unless you go through me. But that truth has to be manifested to you personally. You have to have a personal experience with the, the Ruach HaKadosh, the set-apart spirit, in order for that to become truth to you. So then if the manifestation doesn't come, the truth doesn't come, and you will not believe. You will just be religious. You won't have a personal relationship. Right. You, you walk around saying, I believe in God, but God is not Lord in your life. Right. I, I was listening to a, a preacher the other day, and he said that um, religion, no, reading the scripture without a relationship only keeps you stuck in religion, which means that ultimately you are like the Pharisees. Wow. So the word that is written, it has, the word that is written is Christ. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when, it's like when you're studying the scripture, you are speaking to God himself. Wow. You know what I mean? I he, he's you're speaking to him. He's speaking to you're reading the word of God, which is him speaking to you. Then you ask him questions as you're reading. Then he will lead you and guide you into all truth. It won't happen like that if you haven't first believed. Right. So it's, it's the same concept of, Period. of driving down the road and you're losing your way. It, if you need your way. I mean, we have a. Uh, the, the GPS. The GPS now, so we can punch it in with our hand, or we can pull over and we can speak and we can say the directions, and then it shows up on the screen and it talks to us and yeah. it can it shows us the way. Yeah. So when you read the Word of God, yes, it's yes. just guiding you through life, showing you the way. It is a GPS. And what is this GPS leading us? It's leading us back to the, the Father. Father. That's belief. Does that make sense? It does to me. Verse three. Yes. That which we have seen, okay, so verse 1, uh, God must reveal himself to us before we can come into fellowship uh -huh. or into relationship. Verse 2, this is the foundation. The foundation of relationship is that he manifests himself to you. Right. His spirit <laughs> is manifested to you. And then verse 3, here is an invitation to relationship. So here's what verse 3 says. That which we have seen... And heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. this, this verse right here is when it, when it starts to get uh -huh. real good, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to look at that verse again. Look at it. Uh, real, let's look at a closer look. That which we have seen... Mm -hmm. 
and heard, it's like he's repeating what was right. said. Right, he, he's repeating what he said in verse 1, one. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you that you also uh-huh. may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship <clears throat> is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. Now, if you look at verse 3 really closely, you can see discipleship yes. in that verse, right? Because he's saying, what we have heard, what we have seen, we're going to declare it unto you. In other words, we're going to train you in the same way. But Why? So that you can have fellowship with us and with the Father. But the only <laughs> way that they could give it to someone else is that they had a manifestation of the truth within themselves. Right. You can't lead a person where you've never been before. Uh-huh. And you can't teach the scripture with an anointing unless the anointer has manifested the truth of the scripture in you to give away. Right. You're absolutely Period. Right. I'm going to read it. From the New Living Translation, (coughs) verse 3. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and Mm -hmm. heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to see here that uh, this type of fellowship is exclusive. Yes. You can't have this type of fellowship unless you're one of us. And in order to be one of us, you have to have fellowship with Christ. He has to come in your heart. Because once he comes in your heart, then you become one of us. You become a peculiar person. person. Yeah. I want to highlight that word koinonia. It says, that which we have seen, Mm -hmm. they have seen Christ, and heard, they heard his teaching. That we will declare to you that you may have koinonia with us. With us, the people who know God. Right. Here's what koinonia means or fellowship means. It means partnership. It literally means to participate with Christ. Uh-huh. It, it literally means social intercourse. That means that we are intimately social with one another and with Christ. It means pecuniary benefaction. Wow. That's what the... right. That's what the um, strong says. It means that when you are in fellowship, you literally are able to give financial aid to those who need it. So if you are in koinonia, if you are in fellowship, you're not just giving of yourself. You're not just giving the word manifested in you, but you are giving of yourself to social intercourse and you're giving of your money for financial aid. It also means koinonia means to communicate. It means communication. Uh It means communion. So I I was remembering as I was reading this, homeschooling our children and um, teaching them like the prefix and the suffix of words. So I looked up com, C-O-M, and it means with. Mm. It means together. It means in association with. Right. It means to contribute and to distribute. So uh-huh. if you say that you are saved and you are one with the Lord, that you have heard him, that you have seen him, that he has manifested himself in you, and you don't have fellowship with people, later on, the Bible says that you are a liar and the truth is not in you. To say that we have fellowship with God and not with people is a manifestation that you really don't have fellowship with God or else you would have social intercourse with people. Mm -hmm. That is good to me. Right. Look at verse 3. Let's read it again. That which we have seen Uh and heard... Declare we unto you that you also may have koinonia or fellowship with us. And truly our koinonia is with the Father and with his son Jesus Christ. Now I want you to see in the text that he is saying it's important to have fellowship with each other. Mm -hmm. And that type of fellowship will lead to fellowship with the Father. Right. So I, I think sometimes uh, we just want to have fellowship with God. With God. That's religion. But we don't want to have fellowship with people. With people. But he says, 
you must have fellowship with us. This is true fellowship because if, you, if we have fellowship together, then we can have a true relationship with God. My Lord. I want, let me see what it says in the New Living Translation. Mm -hmm. Stop at, pretending like you, you are not that spiritual. You always talking about you heard from God, you heard from God, you heard from God, but people don't hear from you. Later on, the Bible's going to call you a liar. So I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying if we say that we believe like the scripture says we right. believe, then you're not going to just love God and not love his people. Because ultimately, the purpose of you loving God is to carry out the Great Commission. And, and you can kind of see the Great Commission in verse 3 where it says um, that you also may have fellowship with us. Uh -huh. And when you have fellowship with us, we want to let you know that truly having fellowship with us is having fellowship with God because mm -hmm. he lives on the inside of us. Because he says that once we have fellowship together, then our fellowship will be fellowship with the Father. So in other words, if we have fellowship among each other, then we're going to have corporate worship and corporate praise and corporate fellowship with the Father. Strictly because we believed. Going back to verse 1. <laughs> In the beginning, we heard, we saw, we studied, we touched Jesus, the word of God. He manifested himself to us. Right. And because he did that to us, then we can give you the tools that you need to be ushered back into the cross. Right. Fellowship. So no one is an island. I mean, this, this gospel is not designed for you to get it, for you to stay at home, for you to read it, and for you not to fellowship with anyone. So stop using coronavirus as an excuse, <clears throat> by the way. We must fellowship. Matter of fact, if you go back to the beginnings of the church, it started because they broke bread from house to house. And that's how the fellowship. church grew. It's called, that was the first small group. Mm -hmm. They were going from house to house. And then we say that we I love God. The, I thought it was the first potluck, community potluck. Well, call it what you want. They were in <laughs> fellowship. They were in, let me go back to my slide. Bread. They were in partnership with each other and Christ. <laughs> they participated with each other and Christ. They had social intercourse. So when you say we went to a church fellowship and you sat beside someone and you had a cup of coffee, <laughs> but didn't get to know them intimately intimately you really did not have fellowship because to have fellowship with Christ is to know him intimately to have fellowship with people is to know him intimately it means that right. you contribute financially to the cause of of uh, pressing forth and um, extending the gospel to the lost it means that you are in communication right. with God and the saints that means that you are in communion with God and the saints that means that you contribute that means that you serve. Why are you serving? So that we can get the gospel out. That's it. Simple. I mean, if, if we don't break bread with each other, then why are we looking forward to sitting there with Jesus, fellowshipping with Jesus, and we can't even fellowship down here? So we know that <laughs> there are issues in our soul that makes us um, not feel comfortable with fellowshipping with people. But our trauma from the past should not stop us from going forward because he is a healer. And he said, old things will pass away and everything will become new. So when everything becomes new, you need to fellowship because it is written. If you truly, truly become intimate with the Lord, he will heal you and give you the ability to fellowship with people. And, and I want to say it's not people. It's We're Christ. talking about uh, fellowshipping with each other. We're talking about fellowshipping with saints, with brothers and sisters. So we're not strangers to you because we're of the same way. Uh -huh. We are a people of the way. Right. Therefore, we should be able to fellowship with each other because, let's just face it, we're in the same club, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're in the same group. So then, so then if I go to Ethiopia and we go to a church there, we are going to visit our family in Ethiopia because if they are in communion with Christ and we are commu in communion with Christ, then our spirits will connect and we will have communion with each other. So no matter where you go in the world, when you really truly meet a, a, a man or woman of God, you're meeting your extended family. Exactly. So then you should just love them and shouldn't say, well, I don't know you. 
You need to know them. The scripture says know them by the spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, we all want to get to Revelation where he saw all nations, but we can't get to all nations right here. Yeah. Verse four. Do you want me to go to verse four? Yes. Okay. So first John chapter one verse. And I pray in the name of Jesus that we all become convicted. Okay. Here's another thing. Well, you're an extrovert. It's easy for you. I'm an introvert. It's not easy for me. But the scripture doesn't say in the beginning we heard and we saw and right, we right, fellowship right. because we were extroverts. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that. It doesn't matter whether or not you are an extrovert or an introvert. Introvert. You, uh -huh. You're supposed to fellowship with God and people. Now, the fellowship may look a little bit different, but you will still be in communion. You will still be in social intercourse. You will still be giving your financial aid to build a kingdom, period. Mm -hmm. So verse 4. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. So he's saying that without fellowship, you have no joy because you feel isolated and alone. So in order that your joy may be full, you must fellowship with one another. Now, we're still talking about believe. So true believers fellowship. We fellowship because we have something in common. I'm going to read this, what I wrote. It says, or, or this is a, a piece of the commentary um, on slide seven. John wrote this letter so that both he and the readers may have much joy. It would give them all much joy if they believed in the message right. of the gospel, which is what verse 1 and 2 says. The purpose of the letter is that the readers would share the same life as John and his friends. Right. So, so, so when we don't have fellowship with right. each other, then the, our belief system is a little bit skewed. Right. We, you know, by, by nature, we are prone to find something that's familiar to us. Right. I, if we go to a place that we've never seen before, never been before, we look out for people who are dressed like us. We look out for people who uh, look like us, right? Uh, we may go to a restaurant. We may look to see, see people who eat the same thing we eat. If we go to a sporting event, then we see people in line with the same sporting team on that we support. We like to get ourselves up in little groups. We like to, we like to join ourselves to a team, so to speak. So this is what we're talking about here in this fellowship. We are joined to the body, and every joint supplies. There are many members in the body, but yet there's only one head, one God. So we all are part of this team of fellowship, and therefore. If we all serve the same God, then there shouldn't be any isms and schisms. It shouldn't be. You <laughs> said a few minutes ago, you said um, that when, if we walk into a room, we try to find somebody that we can identify with. Mm -hmm. You know, if I walk into a room, I may try to find someone who it, it looks like me. I may try to find another female. I may try to find someone that has children because that's that is familiar to right. me. That is actually called behavioral science. Mm -hmm. In behavioral science, it says that people will conjugate with people that they know. So this right here, verse 1, 2, 3, all the 10 scriptures that we're going to teach, this is behavioral science. If you believe in Christ and you have relationship with him, <laughs> even the scientists caught up with God and said, then you will have an identification identification with people who are just like you, which yeah. means believers. Well, it's the same logic that the pack uses. You look at a pack of animals, whatever. Yeah, yeah. They travel in a pack because there's safety in number. Yeah. There's protection there, right? So when he says that we as Christians, we need to come together and fellowship with each other because we draw strength from so each other. So you can really just look at the animal kingdom. You can go to National <laughs> Geographic and you can look at um, the different animal kingdoms uh -huh. and see how they all um, move together, eat together. Work together. And, they are, and you, you don't necessarily see a lion devouring another lion. You don't see um, an antelope devouring a, another antelope. They literally, even down to an ant, they literally communicate and work together to build an yeah. ant. Those tiny ants can build 10-foot mounds. 
only because they work together. Mm -hmm. But the people who have intellect and consciousness can't, something mm -hmm. is wrong in the body. Verse 6. Verse 5. Verse 5. Mm -hmm. So in verse 5 or in verse 4, the result is joy because we have relationship. Uh -huh. Verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness. And that's amazing. We just got through talking about fellowship, 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 uh, being in fellowship with one another, being in fellowship with God, being in corporate fellowship. And he says, well, why is this so important? Well, it's important because there is no darkness in God. He is light. So we shouldn't be worried about, uh, and I, I hear this a lot, be careful who house you go over because you don't want no spirits uh, getting, getting on, on you. <laughs> getting or you on don't want to even bring those spirits in your house. Or you don't want to invite those spirits in your house. But if we have true fellowship, then we're not worried about any spirits because we know who we're fellowshipping with. If a dark spirit comes into your house where the light is, they will not be able to stay. They will become uncomfortable. Something is going to happen. Some type of exposure is going to happen. But if a dark spirit is coming into your sphere of influence that is dark, then y'all go sit down and have koinonia, mm -hmm. fellowship together right. with no conviction or change. I mean, if we're so, con if we're so concerned about someone's spirit getting on us then we should be more concerned about converting that spirit right because we're talking about discipleship right. also right mm -hmm. this then i'll read again this then is the message which we have heard of uh -huh. him and declare unto you that god is light that god is light and in him in god is no darkness at all right verse six if we say this is this is the scripture right here. Now before we move on to verse six, listen to what it says. It says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if we have the light in us, then in us should not be any darkness at all. So when we encounter darkness, our light should shine upon that person well, and expose the darkness and that's what he them. says mm -hmm. let your light shine before men that they'll see your good works and give god glory in heaven uh -huh. let your light shine let your light shine if we say that we have koinonia or fellowship with him uh -huh. and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth so i looked up that word dark and um there's the greek word is Parapateo. Uh -huh. The Latin word is perpetus, which probably really means nothing. But those words come from the English word perpetual and uninterrupted. So it says, um, if we say that we have fellowship with him and we are perpetually or without interruption walking in darkness, then we lie and do not the truth. Right. So it's not saying that we won't sin it means that when god convicts us of a certain specific thing then we won't perpetually walk in that thing because if we do it means that we're not in the light right and in uh, verse six it really goes about to establish god's holiness right so if we have fellowship with him then we're in his holiness look at it again verse six if we say that we have fellowship with him and perpetually or continually without conviction walk in darkness, then we are liars and do not the truth. Mm -hmm. And so I looked up, I, I don't know, I was reading something and they said, when you find truth, you have found a supernatural intervention. Wow. So then really conviction we shouldn't really push con conviction away. Right. If, if, if truth is a supernatural <laughs> intervention, then when we're operating in that darkness, the intervention comes in and then puts us back on the narrow road that mm -hmm. leads to righteousness. And that is what a true believer will do. Right, because it starts with, it starts with God himself. You know, our fellowship, our existence starts with his holiness. His holiness is not there to make us feel bad 
his holiness is there to expose to us what we need. So he is righteous from the beginning. Yes. And listen, he's you're, you're God is not trying to figure you out. <laughs> he already knows who you are and he knew who you were from the beginning. The beginning. So there is no shadow in him. You're not hiding anything in, in from him, but he's still saying you can be in fellowship with me. God almighty. If we say that we have fellowship with Christ Jesus, and we perpetually walk in the sin that he has convicted us time after time after time again, then the scripture says you are a liar and you do not walk in the truth. In other words, you have not accepted the supernatural intervention. Wow. Verse 7, but, here's the hope, if we walk uh -huh. in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship, koinonia, communion, one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us all from all sin. You, I want you to see in the scripture, he said what he had to say. First of all, he said you must have fellowship among you. And then, you, then your fellowship will come up to me. And then in, in, in verse 6, it says that if we have fellowship with him and don't walk in, and walk in darkness then we really don't have the truth. We're not practicing true fellowship, right? And the truth will make you free. And the truth is not in us. So then he tells us that, but, verse 7 says, but we, but if we walk in the light as he is the light, yeah. then we have fellowship with one another. So he basically says the same thing again and flips it back around. So in order for us Jesus. to have fellowship with him, we must have fellowship with each other. And in order to have fellowship with each other, we must have fellowship with him. So if we have fellowship with each other, it's a good thing if our brother or sister calls us out on something because iron sharpens iron. Right. And we want to be sharpened so that we can become more impactful as we go about the Great Commission. Right. It's coming together for me. Um, but if we, verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus, meaning his death. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us all from sin. And this is very interesting because one of the reasons to have fellowship with each other Jesus. and fellowship with him is for the cleansing of sin. <laughs> if we have fellowship with him, then he Jesus. Can, can reveal to us the shortcomings of our life. But we have a tendency not to hear the voice of God all the time. But since we also have fellowship with each other, then that voice is repeated. Remember, uh, 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 Jonathan said to David, thou art the man. The man. No, right? no, no. Was it Na Jonathan? Uh, Nathan. Nathan. Nathan mm -hmm. said, you are the man. You the because man. of fellowship. He had, fe David has, God said, David is a man after my own heart. Right. But sometimes he was blinded by his own actions. Oh, and you know what? I read I read that when he hooked up with Bathsheba, he was not in fellowship with God. Mm -hmm. Because if he was, he wouldn't have done that. Like, homie had the woman's husband killed. But because God loved him, God sent someone who was in fellowship with God to go bring him back into Fellowship. So even there we see the commission, the great commission. Mm -hmm. Even there we see discipleship. Yes, we do. Verse, uh, wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me, I want to share with you what I found um, from the commentary. It's mm -hmm. called the Free Bible Commentary in Easy English. I really like this commentary. Um, in, ter in regards to 1 John 1 and 7, the light, it says, the person who continually and willingly does wrong lives in darkness the person who continually and willingly does right lives in light god wants us to believe the gospel believe the gospel believe the word believe the truth believe him mm -hmm. and we should live to please god why because he is holy and i know that sounds rudimentary i know that sounds elementary but at the end of the day if we say that we have been born again 
If right. we say that we have received the gospel and we have truly been converted, then our life, the way we think, what we do, is going to show forth that convention, that conversion. But it doesn't mean that we're sinless. But it does mean that we will be, that we will sin less and be um, convicted of the word mm -hmm. of God. Right. Verse eight. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Mm -hmm. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, <laughs> and the truth is not in us. So, in other words, we're all striving to walk in the light, to live a life open before God, seeking his holiness Jesus. and hating sin. But as we try to live open before God, as we continue to seek his holiness, if we say that we have no sin, then we are so if, if lying. We, and if we don't admit that we have sin, where does that leave us then? It just leaves us in the dark. If we, This is what the preachers need to stop doing. Preachers need to stop acting like the blessings of the Lord are always making them rich and they never have to go down um, onto the, the threshing floor. That they never, like, I think that we are doing a great injustice to the body of Christ as representatives in leadership when we pretend or act like it's just the blessings and the blessings and the blessings, but nobody talks about how we had to be crushed and how we were in pain and how we had right. to fight back depression and how the marriage almost fell apart and how the, you know, what is it called when you, when you, when you don't have money to pay anything and you have to bankruptcy. bankruptcy. Nobody talks about the bankruptcy. Nobody, everything is just okay and copacetic. Nobody talks about the confession that they had to make to be restored to God. And I think that that's a great injustice. You know, I, I think sometimes uh, we look at pride. walking in light as a description or a class of people. Yeah, walking in the light is not a description or a class of people. It's not, a, it's not spiritual people who have arrived. You know, it, walking in the light is not you, well, you, you've achieved this perfection and now you're better than everyone else. Rather, it describes all believers. All believers must strive to walk in light and not in darkness. So it's not a special group of people who have arrived. Lord have mercy. No one has arrived. We all have to take up our cross daily. And walk. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is, a, this is a very sobering, sobering moment. The Bible says here, in verse 9, if, if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in order to confess a sin, yes. you have to be convicted of the sin. Right. You know, and one of, one of the biggest sins that uh, we have to deal with on a daily basis, and I'm not talking about sexual sin. It's something very simple. It's not forgiving people. We, on a, on a daily basis, we are faced with a choice to forgive or not to forgive. Well, if I think that maybe <coughs> if we talk to people and ask them what, what one of their biggest issues are, I, I think that majority of the people will say that they are either mad at someone or they're mad at God. <coughs> That's terrible. Either way, it's unforgiveness. Period. You, you, you haven't forgiven the person who hurt you. But you love God. And you're in fellowship with him. That's why we all have to strive daily to walk in the light. The root <coughs> of bitterness is a horrible cancerous, devouring demon. Mm -hmm. Bitterness will put you out of fellowship with God, because that's what the scripture says, and with people. Mm -hmm. So whoever hurt you, whoever mm -hmm. betrayed you, whoever threw you under the bus, whoever didn't um, uh, amount up to what you wanted them to amount up to, and now you've got, you're feeling some type of way, but 
it will behoove us all not to operate in that because we can uh, break our fellowship with God, ultimately breaking our, self, uh, our fellowship with people, which means now we're over here and off to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Look, but we're Christians, babe. That that does it don't that don't line up. It doesn't line up. One of the things that we're trying to do here at Kadosh to increase fellowship is we have created these connect cards, and these connect cards are designed for you to take names of people and write them down and connect with people because we're all in fellowship together. You know, one of the greatest tricks of the enemy is to convince us that we're the only one going through that thing that's going through this certain problem that no one feels the same way we do however when we start to connect with people in the body Jesus. in fellowship then we can draw strength we can with people can hear our story hear our testimonies and they can build us up so we were talking about you and i we were talking about blind spots and the importance of showing each other our blind spots Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to read verse 8, 9, and 10 from the New Living Translation, um, and then I think we've come to the end. But it says, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the right. truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins mm -hmm. and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our heart. Wow. <laughs> so we all should be confessing our sin because we all have sin in our life. But he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of our sins. That takes humility. But first of all, we must admit, and, and pride, remember, oh. pri pride goes before a fall. A fall goes before destruction. Yeah. So a lot of times our lives are destroyed because we're trying to maintain an image. We're trying to maintain this image of righteousness, like we're so holy and so pure. And it is a stop. You, this is a red flag. If you are in fellowship with a person and it is always good all the time and the Lord is always blessing and everything is always right. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. I'm going to read it from this verse. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Wow. But if we can adultery, if you confess your hatred, if you confess your addiction, if you confess that you're stealing from your place of, of, of employment, God will, he, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from the wickedness, verse 10. But if we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. You know, our sins, you know, we, we like to put sins in categories, categories. right? Big sin, little sin, yeah. you know, justified, unjustified. But with the scripture is saying that we all have sin. We all have those things. And I think we all deal with pride and unforgiveness. Yeah. So we don't need to go out and look for a person who has uh, adultery, who is stealing and all that. Oh, yes, those are sins, but... What about the, the person leaven. who is prideful? Yeah. What about the person who has unforgiveness? What about the person who is bitter? Who see, won't fellowship? See, those other sins, you, you can see a person stealing. You can see a person in adultery, but can I see you in bitterness? Can I see your unforgiveness? No, that's the iniquity that's in, in your heart. And that's what God's And that's after. what God's after. That's what he wants. But... That which was from the beginning, which we have, if we have truly heard what was spoken today, if we have truly seen with our eyes, which we have studied today, this morning, and our hands have touched the truth, then there should be some confession. And I wish that we were packed out because this would be a fantastic altar call. Right. But we definitely thank you for tuning in to this lesson. And we pray that you will go back 
and look over these scriptures. But before we let you go, we want to give you the opportunity to give. But before before that, though, uh -huh. I want to give them the opportunity to if you, if you want a minister to minister to you one on one, if you want to confess that whatever you're going through one to another, uh -huh. then I want to encourage you to call the church and make an appointment with the administrator or just go to the messenger messenger on Facebook right. and um, give us your name. Give us your number. We'll have somebody get back in touch with you so that we can minister to you on whatever it is that is separating you from God so that we can push you back to the cross so that you can be fully restored so that your money will be right so you can give. All right. And that's coin and neat. And there are several <laughs> ways to give to the ministry. I said you would go to our website and look at those ways to give. You can text to give. You can cash app or you can just simply uh, go online and follow the prompts there. We definitely appreciate your free will giving. We also appreciate you uh, watching us today and we pray that you're safe from the uh, weather and that you're protected and that we will see you again next Sunday. But before we go, you want me to pray? we would like to pray for you. So God, we thank you for what our eyes have seen, what our hearts have felt, what our yes, hands Lord. have touched. God, we pray that you allow this wor word to go down deep on the inside of us. Mm -hmm. You said that your word is like a two-edged sword. That thing that is keeping us out of fellowship with people and you, give us the courage, oh God, to confess yes, it so that you can cleanse us with your blood from that unrighteousness. God, I pray that you give us the courage, no matter how embarrassing, no matter how low it makes us feel, no matter how judge the enemy says that we will be, to go to a person, a, a yes, man Lord. or a, a woman of God, and confess that thing so that we can get in right state standing with God and with people. Mm. I trust that your name, your word will not return void to those who truly believe. I trust that this word will restore the backslider. You, I trust that this word will restore those of us who are currently in active sin. Mm. I thank you that you will cleanse us from that unrighteousness. And Lord God, even though the process of being cleansed hurts, I declare and decree that we will be strong and courageous and slew the adversary that is preventing us from being about the Lord's business. We thank you and we praise you for the truth in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Blessings and peace. Shalom.